Okay, cool. So we are with uh, Dr. Cowan. Um, Nick, I have a different system here, so I just need to make sure that you can hear me okay. You're good over there. Now, you, you know can... what? I can't hear you as well as I could hear you before, so I'm a little bit disappointed, actually. Yeah, I know, because I'm using like a $2 kind of plug-in headphone <laughs> mic right here. Dr. Cowan over here has like at least wireless Bluetooth <laughs> stuff happening. I have like which a- is not, Which is not good. I'm trying to get away from this wireless stuff. Yeah, oh, oh, yeah, your brain, oh, I can see were... your brain shriveling up from here. It must be impacting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you can smell it shriveling. <laughs> yeah, okay, not, so not, uh, not the best. Let's, uh, let's just start. At the, so, you know, thanks for doing this, first of all. I mean, everyone's lives a little kind of upside down right now and a little kind of crazy. So thank you for doing this. I just wanted to start right at the beginning. Um, and I think the number one question that you're probably getting at a time like this is, how do we best support our immune systems? And I think one of the emails that you sent out, I just wanted to ask you about that because you kind of laid out, I think like a base stack of items that we should all consider taking. And I'll just run through them and then I'm gonna ask you about them. I think it's zinc, vitamin D3, vitamin C, some sort of probiotics and anything else to support your immune system kind of after that. Um, can we just start with that? And the one I wanted to start with, with I know the least about zinc. Like I've heard about vitamin C and vitamin D and I'll talk to you about that, but like, why is that one of your like top three things for uh, supporting your immune system? And am I saying that accurately? Is that what you were talking about in one of your emails? I think that was after, uh, after we had chatted, you sent something like that to me and that was like the stack that you were recommending. Yeah. I mean, so first I want to start off by saying like, we're not actually supposed to give medical advice based on a regulatory board. So I'll kind of tell you guys what, what we're doing at home and what kind of strategies um, we're employing. And then people can kind of like use that as their base. Um, and then to speak to a qualified practitioner too, right? So someone who, and your primary care practitioner may not even be that person. They may not be well-versed in that kind of area. So uh, someone qualified would be best to know kind of your specific scenario. Like I can give you specific Tom, cause I, you know, we've worked together for many years, right? So I kind of know, what things would work well based well, on everything I, else. I love it when on. we get right into the bureaucracy of the medical system right now, but, but that's fair. That's totally fair. And yeah, can, can you just, to. for people who don't know you, can you just share your title and your profession so they're aware of who's speaking to them right now? Yeah. So I'm a naturopathic doctor and functional medicine doctor. So trained like a family doctor. Um, but then we have additional um, education in natural medicine, botanical medicine, and us specifically like our clinic focused on how to optimize health. Like we're trying to uh, maximize health, maximize performance. So it's a bit of a different angle for people. And um, yeah, I don't want to water down any of the content here, but we just have to say that based on our, our regulatory board and stuff. But we'll tell you kind of what we do. And I think people will be able to take away some good things from that and, and apply it to them. But they should keep in mind, like everyone's a little bit different. So some of the things may not exactly line up depending on what other health issues you have going on, right? Um, the cool thing about all this stuff is though, that this is a great time for people to really uh, maximize their health, right? There's no, been no other point in time where it's been so apparent and so obvious that there are things that you can be doing to take yourself out of a higher risk category. Um, even if you look at all the stats, most people who are um, getting infected and having bad outcomes from this have underlying health issues already present. Like I was looking at the New York stats uh, yesterday. I think it's 97% of the fatalities in New York um, all have underlying health issues. So whether it be obesity, diabetes type two, autoimmune issues, 97% of them uh, had some sort of underlying health issue. So it's a good place for people to sort of think about this stuff more seriously. And the experts are saying too, like it's, it's not unlikely this is the last super bug we're gonna come across. You know, so. When you say obesity, I'm curious, what is what defines obesity? Like, is it, the body mass index or like, you know, is that what, like, I guess I'm just yeah. trying, if someone feels like they're, they have an extra five pounds on them, are they obese or is it, you need an extra 50 on you? Yeah. So it's based on the BMI, which, which we know has some fault, but um, the BMI is sort of the standard way to assess that. And in the U S 47% of the population is obese based on their BMI. So yeah, what, what is the problem, it? right? What is some are, what are some of those measurements that would, uh, um, yeah, so if you're like six, yeah. So if you're like a six foot tall male that is 40 years old, 
So what? you're just asking for yourself right now. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, no, you know, cool. I know mine's all, mine's all messed up. Like I actually know that I'm off because of my build. The BMI isn't. I I, I guess I'm giving myself a pass because I feel like it's off a little bit just because it's uh, like I know my body fat percentage and stuff like that. So I feel like it's a little bit off. And I'm just curious, like, what is that? What is what is it for someone like that? So the quickest way, actually, you can just punch it in on like Google and, and enter your specific data and it'll show you what that number is. Oh, okay. Um, I don't, I don't know if it, what it is offhand and it'll give you categories. So it's just really basically laid out. Um, and then there's another equation where you can do like, um, waist divided by hip size to show you a little bit more detail of, you know, like you carry a lot of, uh, muscle mass nick not to pump your tires too much but uh yeah, there you I, go. I didn't want to there say you, go. Yeah. you had to go and say that yeah. i didn't yeah. want to say it but i'm glad you did yeah. so yeah that's great yeah, yeah. <laughs> pretty pretty jacked guys no but uh so your bmi will be higher just based on your weight to height ratio would be higher you know based on your frame and stuff like that so it's not perfectly accurate but i think the uh people who know people who are overweight generally know they're overweight okay. right so pretty obvious but yeah the other thing too is like based on your point tom like a lot of the media is saying you know there's nothing you can do take the basic precautions you know obviously distancing from staying away from people washing your hands and and washing your hands too we've had a lot of questions about that so washing your hands the soap actually disables the coating of the virus so it's one of the things that kind of just inactivates it right away that's why it's so important i know a lot of our patients have been saying like you know this is a stupid like little strategy wash your hands obviously we should all do that all the time, but there, that's the reason for it. So it disables the virus coating and then it can't survive in the air. Um, and do you but, really have, do, from, from your understanding, do you really have to wash your hands for the full 20 seconds that you kind of hear about? Or is, it, is that like the best practice minimum? So like if you wash your hands for five seconds, it's not quite disabling that coating or penetrating the membrane and disrupting or whatever, whatever language yeah. you need to use to describe that? Yeah, and the reason for the timing is more so that you can cover the most surface area. So when they've done research okay. on hand on hand washing, most people miss the fingertips and the backs of the hands. Like some of the places where you touch your face the most, most people don't ever do that. You wash your hands kind of like on the palms mainly, right, or the fronts of your fingers. Most people don't do the other areas, so that's why lately, they lately I've been a yeah. surgeon washing my hands, yeah. and I'm like washing yeah. my hands, fingertips, <laughs> yeah. thumbs. Like I don't think I've washed my thumbs before. That's another area for me personally. I'm like I don't think I remember washing my thumbs the way I'm washing them. Right yeah. Now. <laughs> yeah, so those videos are actually pretty good online. I don't know if you've seen them circulating. People washing them hand, their hands, putting like the black powder on white gloves, and showing oh, I haven't, them how no. to get all. Yeah, those are actually pretty useful. We have um, a lot of our families in in, in medicine, so um, and doing different like emergency med um, physicians and stuff like that are in our family. So they've um, talked about that to us before. So we kind of know the stats on that. Um, but yeah, so there's a lot of things that you can do. You know, obviously you want to take this thing seriously. You want to avoid people and minimize contact. If you're in contact with people frequently, infrequently, like a lot of our patients are police officers, firefighters, um, working in hospital, family doctors. I had a family doctor a patient yesterday. Um, so they're in contact with people often, right? So in that sense, you want to be able to boost your health as much as you can. And you've probably seen some of the data on vitamin C. I don't know if you've seen some of that stuff going around. Um, I have like not. In, I'm so knee deep in interest rates and the amount of debt going on yeah. in the world and what's happening with hard <laughs> yeah. assets. And I'm just like yeah. so focused. That's why you're yeah. here. But so, so tell, yeah, can okay. you tell us? So in China, for example, they've been doing uh, vitamin C as a treatment for COVID-19. And then they're using it for moderate to, to severe cases and having a lot of success with it. So they're using vitamin C orally and uh, vitamin C intravenously. Um, so it's been effective. There's also some new studies coming out on zinc. It's going to take a while before anything becomes perfectly concrete because this virus is new. So all the stuff that we're talking about in order to boost your immune system is based on like other versions of coronavirus that already exist, right? And influenza and things that are similar um, that are going to act similarly. We know kind of what kind of things you can be doing to prevent those things. So we're trying to apply that over and that's why in China and in New York, they're doing a vitamin C um, and it's, it's so far it's looking promising that it's being effective. So you, when you say, levels? yeah, go ahead, Nick. Yeah. I was just curious, like what, what amounts of vitamins do you have any, any indicate yeah. are there any kind of numbers that they're sharing? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so vitamin C, you can't um, manufacture it yourself. Like a lot of the other vitamins and minerals, your body will actually produce itself. I know that sounds weird, but, um, Vitamin C you have to take in. 
So what you would do and what we're doing at home is we're starting at a low dose, like about 500 milligrams or a thousand milligrams per meal. And then you could increase that each day. And then um, it's, this is kind of a non-technological way of doing it. But when your bowel movements get loose, you're at peak absorption. I've so, definitely, so it's I, funny I, I've I've definitely gonna, hit that before. Yeah. And that's what I was going to ask because if they're doing yeah. that, yeah, like at what levels they're doing that, that, yeah. that the side effect is going to be not unpleasant elsewhere, but I mean, yeah. the positive is yeah. going to weigh the negatives too, right? Yeah. So you, if you gradually build it up like that, and as soon as you hit the low, the bowel movement's getting looser, then you just keep your dose, like back it off one capsule and keep it there. And that will show your body that you're at maximum vitamin C status. Um, as a protective uh, and, and, device. And, and then go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, and what kind of data were you referring to? You're saying that you've read that it, it seems to be helping calm the virus down or prevent you from getting what, and what, what effect is the vitamin C having? Can you repeat that? So in China and in New York, they're actually using it to treat positive cases. Hmm. And, right? and the so treatment is just positive. like the, just what you're saying, like the max dosage somebody can absorb. Yeah, yeah. So they're doing intravenous and they're also doing oral dosages. Um, I'm not sure how they're deciding which one, but so intravenous, um, the only difference is there's no barrier to how much you're, you can absorb more quickly through intravenous, but you can hit that same state per individual by just maximizing your oral dose, yeah, okay. right? And then um, the idea is if you're, if you're building yourself up like that, if your immune is weaker, you can tolerate much more. Like we like if your immune system is down, your body kind of opens the floodgates for vitamin C and you can absorb max, like really high amounts. Oh, got it. Okay. Like, so our patients will notice that. So like, let's say your normal state, you're able to absorb like maybe 300 or 3000 milligrams a day, Tom. And you're like, that's my bowel. That's my maximum I can take. Then all of a sudden your immune system gets weaker. You might be able to take 10,000 milligrams a day before your bowels get loose. Got it. Right? Okay. So some pa- some people we've had in the past have taken up to twenty thousand milligrams a day, like during uh, immune, immune weakness, okay. and not have any bowel issues. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, wow. Because your body okay. like opens so, the floodgates. Okay. So I have two quick questions on that. First, I had read somewhere I forget which doctor I had heard somewhere said something that they weren't completely sold on your body's ability to absorb supplemental vitamin C that you were not getting from like natural foods like oranges or something like that. Um, have you heard? So that's my first question. The second question is I currently am taking some time released capsules on vitamin C because uh, I think it was something that maybe you and I discussed like a long time. I, yeah. I forget, I, I forget where I got this idea, but I'm like, this will be better. Cause I can, I can take it and I can absorb it better because it's released a little bit in stages. Is that just yeah. like a marketing myth of that vitamin C capsule? I'm taking the time released one, or is that actually what's happening? Um, so yeah, so it's you know, are you familiar really with the, t- the, the, yeah. the, the type I'm talking about, those vitamin C yeah. capsules that are time released? It says time released on yeah. it or something? Yeah, so the idea is you're not trying to flood your receptors for vitamin C. So you're trying to like slow down the amount they can take in. Because let's say you're going to take 10,000 in a day, let's say. But let's say you took it, you tried to take it all with breakfast. Your body would only be able to absorb so much of that 10,000. Totally. It yeah. to be eliminated. So the idea is like if you space it per meal, it's the same idea as time release. Right. So you're, absor- you're not flooding the receptors so that you can absorb the max amount at each interval. Um, and um, in terms of like a food source is being better, there's a little bit of truth to that, but really you need to have a high enough vitamin C dose to make a difference. Right. So you'd have to eat a lot of like oranges to hit that level. Um, it is true because the white part of the orange, it contains something called bioflavonoids. So they help allow the, the vitamin C of the orange to get into your body. If that makes sense, kind of like um, okay, kind of like you have an inside guy at, at the club that you go to that can get you in easier. Yeah, got it. Okay, it makes sense. You know? Any any natural food source, I'm sure, is going to be a little bit better. But hey, okay, so we, just just go ahead, Nick. I was gonna say before we jump off vitamin C, I have one quick question that I've always wondered about because so many of the options that you buy at you know the, the store if they're chewable or something else, sometimes there's so much other crap in it that yeah. I look at it and I'm like, I'm wondering, like my kids always want the gummy ones and, and a lot of them are full of all sorts of garbage. And I'm like, does, does the garbage in them counteract the benefit of the vitamin C? <laughs> and like, so should you just be taking the kind of like the pure powder and putting it into the drink? Or I, I guess that was just kind of selfishly, I want to ask you that question. 
Yeah, I mean, so some of the stuff that's in like a tablet form, like we only use a capsulated form because you're getting like the pure powder, like you're saying. Some of the stuff that's a binder or a filler just makes it harder for it to absorb. So it's like okay. you're getting a less amount into your system. So we use either a capsulated formula or like a powder that you just mix in um, either either or. Um, we personally at home just take the capsules because you know each capsule has a thousand milligrams. Yeah, then it's, it's easy, easy, it's it's easy, easy to, to do, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah, so, and then for kids, I mean, kids can do like the powders if they like the taste or they can do um, the gummies. At least they're getting some vitamin C in. Um, Even but I with all the right sucralose now, and corn syrup and all that type of stuff that's in it. And... I know. It's not the best, but I know even with my kids too, it's like um, either I get that in and they get something or they or they don't take anything at all. Okay. So like at least a little bit better than nothing. But Yeah, it makes sense. Um, yeah, so vitamin C has, is having a lot of promise right now. There'll probably be good research trials on this a couple of years from now. Um, obviously they don't have any coronavirus COVID-19 research out right now because it, it takes a while to do a t controlled trial, right? So it's going to take a little bit of time, but, and then zinc, I think was another one you asked Tom. So zinc, um, works really well too, because it prevents viral replication in the cell. So it prevents the virus from replicating. So that's why it's effective against like influenza and other like common cold and flu stuff. Um, and that's why there's lots of good data on, on zinc preventing those things. The thing with zinc is though, it sticks to your stomach lining. So it can make you feel nauseous or make you throw up. So if you're taking zinc, it's better to take it like midway through your meal. So you've got food as like a, a buffer there. So it doesn't irritate your stomach lining. Like we have patients that will take a zinc tablet, even if it's a low dose and throw up right away. Um, wow. cause it sticks to the lining. Yeah. So. I don't know if you guys have experienced that, but um, so with zinc, you got to be a little bit more careful by putting it in the middle of the meal. I, I would say if you're going to go that route. Um, Someone gave me a zinc tablet once and said for, asked me to dissolve it under my tongue and say it, it, it tastes sour or sweet. And they said, depending on the way it tasted, I'm either, de I'm deficient in zinc. That yeah. was like a way to test. Is yeah. that? Have you heard of that before? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm it's just going to throw my brother-in-law under the bus. It was him who told me to do that. And I did the test. I'm yeah. like, I don't know. I think it, I, I forget what it tasted like. Maybe it was sour. I, I forget. But you've heard of that? Yeah, it's kind of, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's kind of a crude way of checking because zinc, uh, zinc controls your ability to taste and smell. Okay, got it. So people, people who have a zinc deficiency have a lack of taste and a lack of sense of smell. So uh, if you can't taste that zinc solution in your mouth for 30 seconds, then you probably have a deficiency. Um, oh, you can also you can also blood test it as well. But yeah, zinc zinc is showing some more promising stuff right now. Um, they're doing they're looking at it with COVID right now, for example. But we know already that it's helpful for common cold and flu to prevent those things. And okay, so vi viral. vitamin C seems like something that you would almost take just naturally every day. I don't know yeah. why that's the way I have it in my head. Is zinc another one of those basics that you would tell the average? I know everyone's unique. I'm not trying to yep. get any kind of pure, perfect medical advice here, but in yep. general, yep. can we make a general statement that zinc is something you would take daily or no, you take it through different seasons when, you know, influenza is a little bit higher and you would take it then? Yeah, no, you can definitely do it daily. It's one of the most common deficiencies, magnesium and zinc, very commonly deficient. And for men as well, zinc um, has a huge role in testosterone production and testosterone levels. So it's commonly deficient. So those are kind of um, ones you can take daily. I would say you can adjust the dose depending on the season. Like okay, we're taking it. at home, like at home right now, we're taking like 50 milligrams of zinc. Whereas like regularly, I might take like 10 or 20. And would um, children and take zinc too? Like would, would someone under 12 take zinc or no? Um, you could, but I think it, for kids, it's better to take it in like a multi format. Okay. You'll have a okay. smaller amount. Um, most zinc, first of all, kids probably aren't going to take capsules and tablets anyway, but they might take like a gummy, like you were saying, Nick or whatever. So um, most multis for kids have at least a little bit of zinc, a little bit of vitamin C, a little bit of vitamin D and stuff like that in there. So you'll have a good uh, collection of things. When I go to the store and I come home with gummies today, they're going to be pretty happy. The kids are going to be happy. They, they treat those things like candy. Yeah. They don't even think they're, yeah. they're, they're, they're vitamins. Nick heard testosterone yeah. and he's going to be just jacking up on the zinc now. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah. Don't, don't, don't. I know that comment did not go by Nick for sure. <laughs> His BMI is going through the roof now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. I think you mentioned um, vitamin so D. The basic, the, yeah. And the basics you should be doing, right? So we know for sure the foundational things, sleep, exercise, healthy food, Food with more color has more nutrients in it. So like has more vitamin C, has more nutrients in general. 
Um, sugar will cut off your immune function for a period of time. So if you're comfort craving foods right now, sugar is probably not the best one to be taking. It will weaken your immune function. Um, to get natural minerals too, nuts and seeds are loaded with, with minerals because when they fall off or um, they're trying to regenerate themselves, they're naturally containing a lot of minerals in their content, right? Like, uh, like Brazil nut, for example, is really high in selenium, for example. So when it falls off the tree, it needs to be self-sufficient to regrow. So it already contains all of its nutrients inside the nut or seed so that when it hits the soil, it can regrow itself. Got it. I'm the worst to hear information like that because then I, I hear things like, oh, Brazil nuts are great. And then I'll just like get a case. Nick knows this. I'll like, get like a case of Brazil <laughs> yeah. nuts. I don't know. I heard they're good and I'll just totally OD, yeah. OD on Brazil yeah, nuts. Yeah, there was a point in time, Tom, you were eating like $100 worth of macadamia nuts a day, I think, at one point. <laughs> oh, yeah. man, I love macadamia nuts, man. I just love <laughs> That's it. probably like three nuts. Yeah, oh, that's man. true too. I yeah. remember going to dark chocolate and macadamia nuts. I would go to Whole Foods and load up on like raw macadamia nuts and take yeah. before I knew how much they cost, I would take oh, them yeah. and they and I had a I would have a huge bag. And I took yeah. and the lady just looking at me there and I guess she knew how much it cost and she weighed it and I'm, I thought holy smokes is literally like a loan officer next to the <laughs> to this cashier here. That was crazy. So yeah, I've learned my lesson on macadamia nuts, but I still buy them. I love them. But uh, along okay, those, so, along those lines, a pumpkin seed really high in zinc. So if we're trying to boost zinc levels, pumpkin seeds are high in zinc. Awesome. Okay. And then, hey, I'm ahead. just curious, the sugar comment that you mentioned, um, is that just refined sugar? Like what about fruit? It's like if you decide to eat too, like a bunch of grapes or something because of the, the sugar content of uh, fruits, does the, how, how does that go? Is it just in like, if you just overdo it, like if you go and eat three apples, two oranges, uh, a bunch of grapes and three things of berries, you know, it's, it's too much. Or is there, I've, I've always wondered that, is there a difference in the sugar content because it's naturally occurring sugars in the fruit? No, that's a really good question. Yeah. So the process for fine stuff is going to have a much harder effect on you. And when you're thinking about fruit, it's kind of like there's a bit of sugar in there, but you're also loading up on lots of nutrients too. Like if you're having grapes or whatever, there's tons of nutrients in the skin of the grape, for example, that's offsetting the sugar balance. I okay. wouldn't worry too much about um, going crazy that way. It's more the processed sugars that really shut things down because they also create a lot of inflammation as well. Um, so especially the simple sugar, sugary drinks are, are, are probably one of the worst things, right? Because you can consume so much sugar in one little can or bottle. Sure, yeah, yeah. But yeah, the fruit, the fruit's not bad because you get the nutrient content to balance it out. Okay, cool, thank you. And I think we touched on it, but just I just want to make sure we did. Vitamin D, you said, what was the dose? It, vitamin D, it's important, and how much to take every day? Vitamin D is a tricky one, okay, because it's fat-soluble. So it will increase in your system and can become toxic if you take too much. So vitamin A, D, and K are fat-soluble, so they will accumulate in your body. So remember how we talked about vitamin C, you can take – up to a certain amount until your body can tolerate it and then you'll excrete the rest. So vitamin D won't do that. So um, vitamin D, you, you'd start at a low level, like we, we would take like maybe a thousand or 2000 maximum a day. Um, but for that one, if you're going higher doses, you want to get your blood checked to see what your level's like. Most right. people are deficient, so it's pretty safe to be taking it. But we had a patient a couple of years ago who um, was taking vitamin D on her own and she was taking a full dropper so she's supposed to take one drop and she thought it was one dropper. Oh, and her, yeah. So she's taking that every day and she went into vitamin D toxicity, like her liver ex expanded, um, her hair all fell out. So she had some negative consequences. That was the only person we've seen like that, but vitamin D is one of the ones that will accumulate in your body. So you have to be a little bit more careful. The other vitamins are all water soluble, which means that when you hit your limit, you'll just pee them out or eliminate them out. So vitamin D, I would keep it at a lower level until you get some testing or whatever. But we blood test all of our patients and we always see deficiency. Like I don't think we've seen anybody with like proper vitamin D level. I don't think I've ever seen one. Okay. And then what is it that vitamin D is doing that's beneficial? So it just, it's like an immune stimulant. So it's upregulating your immune system. So it's um, able to fight off things a little bit more. Um, zinc does that too, but zinc, the unique thing about zinc is that the, it stops the viral replication in the cell, which is kind of cool. Like it shuts okay. that down. Um, 
What was the other one you asked? Vitamin no, D. There was that, the vitamin D. And I was just going to ask, the way I'm currently taking vitamin D is in the cod liver mm -hmm. oil one that you like. You know that cod liver yep. oil? I think it has yeah. vitamin D and A. And you had found for me specifically with the blood work that you had done on me that I needed vitamin A, I think, or my body didn't produce it well. And I yes. have to admit, taking that cod liver oil with the vitamin D and A, I, I don't know if it's just a psychological thing, but since I've been taking it daily, regularly, yep. I, that's, I feel good with that. Is, so that's an okay yeah. way to take it with that, that cod liver oil kind of mixture? Yeah, there's a couple benefits. So because those things are fat soluble, vitamin A and vitamin D, you need to have them with food or with the fat to absorb. So in the cod liver oil, it's already all built in, right? It's Got already it. naturally okay. in there. Okay, so the delivery. You're absorb it. Got it. Yeah, it's already built in. And plus you're getting omega-3 from that. Cod liver oil is a great thing. It's like kind of like an old school European style of um, our mom used to get it to us like yeah. every morning but then th that's when we were like kids and then it just kind of disappeared yeah. and then you showed up in our lives and i'm back on cod liver oil <laughs> got the whole yeah. family. so vitamin a and d together are both immune boosters so that's why um you're probably feeling good with that combo yeah it's been good yeah okay and then so then the other one that we naturally seem to talk about when it comes to immune systems is probiotics correct yeah yeah okay yes, so yeah, 100%. And, and this one i seem to have questions about because it seems i think you and i talked about this before but some probiotics can actually make your gut a little bit worse like you have to take the proper probiotics for you is that am i saying that right or, or what yeah. do you have to watch for with probiotics so yeah, it's a good, really good point. Because so I see advertisements our, on TV that's just like, hey, take these probiotics. But now after talking yeah. to you, I've learned that it's kind of like you need the right strains for you or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So in our clinic, we only use human strain probiotics because based on the research and the science that's out there, they actually will implant into your gut and allow you to build more, like they'll stay in your gut for up to eight weeks, right? So if it's not a human strain probiotic, it'll last from 24 hours to 48 hours, right? So most probiotics will be beneficial. They're all beneficial, but the point is that if you want it to make it last longer and actually to boost your gut health longer, a human strain version will implant and stay in there. Whereas most of the other ones are plant grown or soy grown, most of them, so that they will work for a little bit, have an activity, and then you'll lose them through a bowel movement. So they kind of be in and out of your system. So you have to take them all the time to, to get that benefit. Whereas a human strain one, you can kind of like build up your gut for a while and have that eight week period overlap, if that makes sense. So how do you check if it's human strain or not? That's, that freaks me out that like when you say that, by yeah. the way, because I just assumed, I don't know, I thought they would all be human strain. Um, well, all the ones you've used are human strain because the only ones we have here are human strain. So it would say right on there. It'll say or, human strain. So if someone's looking to buy their own, you know, and doesn't have access to you, they could just look and it'll say somewhere human strain, or I guess they can ask. Yep. Okay. Yeah. It'll say right on. There's a couple brands that are doing it. You're going to see more of that now, just based on the research that's coming out, just having the, the effect last longer with the human strain. Um, and in our clinic too, we don't use something called FOS uh, and that will feed any yeast in the gut. We commonly see patients, we do a lot of stool testing. So we see people with a lot of the yeast in their gut, uh, which, which causes sugar cravings, weight gain, a lot of other problems. So we just started using all probiotics that don't have FOS. FOS is a sugar and it feeds yeast. So yeast is yeast main food group is sugar and FOS is like their premium food. So we, all the probiotics we use, we don't even use FOS anymore. It'll say right on there, no FOS, human strain. Um, and then you need to have a dose of at least like 20 billion, 25 billion cells per capsule or per serving or more to make an impact on your gut. Um, one of my patients yesterday was saying she's trying to um, boost her immune system right now, um, doing a tablespoon of yogurt or two tablespoons of yogurt per day. But in a whole cup of yogurt, the amount of probiotics is so low. It's like maybe, maybe 25 million in the whole cup of yogurt, like the individual serving. Whereas like one capsule of a good probiotic would be 20 billion cells in one capsule. So when you think about like you have 3 trillion cells in your gut that are healthy bacteria. So if you're putting like 20 million, you're not going to really make a uh, dent in that. Really, It's not going to make much of an impact. Like you almost want to have a 20 billion impact that goes and kind of changes the dynamic of the rest of the, the group. Right. Okay. And is there a time of day to take probiotics? That's better right now. I think you have me taking mine at the end of the day. Yeah, so with food is better right now. So always with food because you'll maintain more of those cells. Okay, so um, with food at the end of the day. Okay, yeah. I ha in, actually in, haven't been doing that. Okay. In the past, we used to think that you would 
um, be able to keep more of those. Let's say you take a capsule of 20 billion. We thought you'd be able to keep more in your gut by taking it without food because nothing would impact it, right? But now it's showing that you'll maintain more of those cells um, based on the latest um, studies that are out that you'll maintain more of them with a meal. Got it. Okay. Okay. And then are there any other things? I think in one of the emails you had sent out, there was like you had just like an immune, I don't want to call it a cocktail, but like something else to take to support your immune system. Is there just, is just like a general things in addition to zinc, vitamin D, vitamin C, and some probiotics that you would recommend? Or is that just so case by case that you can't even discuss it? Yeah. So that's a good one. So botanicals are effective, but those you have to be really careful with. Like for example, ginseng has really good research on preventing cold and flu and, and boosting immune system. But for example, if you have high blood pressure, you wouldn't want to be using a lot of ginseng. Right. So that's, okay. the, the, botan the botanicals are effective. The mushrooms are effective too. Like different types of uh, mushroom blends are good. I know you have a lot of the mushroom teas and coffees. I like Those my chaga too. tea, like my chaga yeah. elixir or tea or whatever. I don't know. I just love it. Yeah. Yeah. And those are great too. You just have to be, a, we have to be a little more careful with those because you can't rush out and take a whole bunch of ginseng and have your blood pressure go through the roof. Right. So those ones I think you got to be a bit more careful with the water soluble nutrients like we talked about are a little safer, but definitely you want to do the foundational things that we, we talked about, like um, all those basics you should do. And then if you need the extra stuff, then you go to a botanical or, or um, some of the mushroom blends. To is, is the mushroom stuff blood. fat soluble? Or is that water uh, soluble? It's, it's neither. Cause yeah, it's, chaga. Neither. Yes, it's, neither. it's a mushroom. It's a food. Yeah. It's a food. Oh, it's food. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So mushrooms are pretty powerful. They have a lot of good benefits, but you want to be, you, make sure you have someone advising you on which one to take and how much <laughs> that's a little <laughs> okay. bit more, that's a little more be... specific. So yeah. yeah. Great. Sounds like another but mistake think... I'm, I'm making with stuff. Yeah. I need to talk to you about that. Next time we chat, I'm going to be talking to you about some mushroom stuff. Okay. So then a couple other questions. Um, was that it on the, like the basics then, I guess, for like immune support? Did we, I think we covered that, right? Yep. Yes. Okay. Um, I just wanted to ask you, do you have any kind of information? I feel like a couple months ago, you and I were chatting maybe about metabolism, metabolism and some things yeah. that you wanted to discuss with, with people. I forget. Is that something yeah. that's on your yeah. mind right yeah. now? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's big time. Yeah. So right now, most of our patients are using this time to improve themselves. It's really cool to see that. Like there's a small subset of people who are like, I feel defeated and they're just like drinking beer all day and whatever. But most people right now are saying like, how can I optimize my business? How can I learn things, strategize, lose weight, improve myself so that when things come back on that they're ready and they're ahead of the game. Um, so yeah, like metabolism is a big one. So we do like a liver reset program, which is, which is we've been doing for a while now. So your liver controls your metabolism. So it recycles and makes all of your metabolic hormones. So insulin, cortisol, thyroid, testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, either get made or recycled by the liver. And the stat in the US right now is about 40% of people have a, a fatty liver or a, a leaky liver is what it's called. So it means that your liver function is stagnated and it starts to store fat. And once you store fat in the liver, it can only take so much capacity and then you'll start storing it on the abdomen and then deeper on the visceral organs. So if you're trying to access your belly fat and some of the fat on the organs, which is crucial for long-term health, you actually need to reset the liver first. And a side benefit of that is you get to lose a lot of weight. Like typical weight loss right now, if we look at the numbers, when we do a 14-day liver reset, we're seeing people come down like 10 to 12 pounds in 14 days. So we'll give I, I, them- Because I did that liver reset with you, which was just, and you just felt great. And yeah. my weight, I remember weight specifically around my midsection kind of came off. And I remember, I think Mike on our, Mike did it as yeah. well, um, yeah. who works with us. And he said the same thing. So, yeah. Um, yeah. but is, I forget that a liver reset was a good thing to do. Was it just like we had never done it and we obviously should need to, or was it something specific you had seen in me that you thought we should do a liver reset? I think it was, um, and I know you don't mind me saying stuff like this, but no. like, I think it was like maybe some of the, the skin stuff. And for Mike, it was like just trying to lean out and really kind of target some of the, the belly fat specifically. Um, and that's it. a good okay. way to do that. So we use it a lot for people who are plateauing in weight loss. Let's say you're exercising, you're eating well, you're trying to do what the best thing you can do, and you see your weight not budging and not changing. 
we'll live or reset that. We even do that with our UFC guys. Um, I just did that with one of our UFC fighters um, recently, just to break through some of those weight plateaus and move to a different weight class. So we'll do that. Um, right. And then our new program, which we've just been put together um, recently, is our 21-day Get Healthy, Get Fit program. So we put that together because we had so many emails from people saying like, my weight's going up. I'm so stressed. I can't sleep. I can't exercise. I can't go to my gym. People were freaking. We had like <laughs> oh, 200, we had like 200 emails in like the first week of this thing going on. Right. Um, so people were saying, can you have anything ready for us? So we, we actually spent this last weekend and our whole team uh, were together virtually and put together a whole like a, uh, meal plan a full 21 day meal plan for all different calorie ranges and then we put to put together 21 homework 21 days of home workouts you can do all with no equipment um so we did that for people because there's been such a, a demand right now for that so we've been really focusing on that and the liver reset um stuff is, is good right now too if you're trying to reset your body we recommend doing it like once a year um if you back up your liver your metabolism and weight are going to go up and the, the reason being is that insulin will continue to rise. If you just keep raising your insulin, you're going to keep storing body fat as you get older. So people always think, oh, I'm getting older. I just, I'm going to gain fat. Um, it's kind of true, but it's more so because of what's happening hormonally. As we get older, our insulin starts to creep up. And insulin, insulin is your fat storage hormone. So if it's creeping up, you're storing more and more as you get older. So if you can reset that, you can stay leaner at an older age. Like we have some patients in their seventies. We have a guy who's in his seventies. He does a hundred kilometer um, bike races and he's wow. lean, strong, um, feels amazing. Like you wouldn't, you never even guess he's, he's 70. Right. Um, but we're doing all these things to, to optimize. And so why does insulin kind of creep up like that on us? And, and is, is it that the liver can't, isn't processing it? Through, like, is there, what's the, what's the relationship between the liver and insulin? Yeah, so your liver will process and recycle all your hormones. So once they get made and used, it will break them down and get rid of them. So over time, our insulin gets less sensitive because usually because the liver is overrun. Like your liver is a filter. So everything you consume, like we all know the state of our environment, the state of our food, the quality of air, all those things are getting worse and, you know, overall worse and worse. So your liver has to take that job on all the time. So it's running 24 seven. And then you throw in alcohol, poor food, stress. It's kind of overworked. So most of our patients, like even guys that are in like their, you know, later fifties and, and stuff, they've never even, they've never reset that ever in their whole life. So you got 50 years of accumulation. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Right? And you wouldn't really know how to reset it. Right. So for those guys, we're seeing them have like a 180, like they're, for up to the age 50, their weight's going up and they're feeling worse and worse and worse. And then we're resetting them, having them go the other way. Um, but yeah, so as insulin goes higher, you're going to store more body fat almost regardless of what you're doing because your hormones tell your system what to do, right? So even if you're working out all the time and trying to eat better, as that insulin goes up, you're just going to keep storing it. So you got to work harder and harder to achieve the same results that you were like, if you're eating the same way that you were 10 years ago, that you are now perfectly the same, you're get, you're gaining. Got it. That makes sense. You got to work yeah. harder and harder to get the same. You're like always trying to catch up. Yeah, got so it. So okay. one way to kind of cheat the system is is resetting um, liver and turning things backwards. Um, that's a big one, and I think fasting is another big one. So if you're doing types of fasting, that will lower fasting insulin levels. Anytime you're not eating, you're not spiking insulin. Got it. And I forget the insulin is something that we had checked in one of the blood panels or something that we ran together. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. 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 I feel like so after all this is do done, that. I'm going to come and do like a full assessment again with you. <laughs> like yeah. put up my, take all my blood. How am you know, to see this? But, uh, okay. Yeah. So we, that, that we was, always a, blood, look that was at, a blood marker somewhere. Okay. We, yeah, we always look at fasting insulin with all of our patients for that reason, because if that's creeping up, we want to know where it's trending. Like we had, um, I had a guy yesterday, his fasting insulin was 190. We want to see it around 40. Got it. So when it's that high, it doesn't matter what you're eating. You could do keto, paleo, vegan, whatever you're doing, you're turning most of that to fat. 
Got it. Okay. Yeah. I think one of the, the, the liver reset. And then for me, I had that yeast situation that seems to be part of my life. And when we cleaned out that yeast, that was, that, but that was really, uh, for me, that was the more difficult one. Cause I think you put me on like 30 days of no sugar. Yeah. Wasn't that that one? And it was like no white <laughs> yeah. potatoes. I, I forget the list. And it was, I'm going to, I'm just going to say it. It was really tough, but it was, yeah, that's the hardest thing. Oh. Yeah. That's probably the hardest thing we do for people, but we'll only do it once we, once we lab test and see that there's stuff in there. Cause then um, once you get rid of that, then you can keep your gut healthy, keep your metabolism really healthy. Cause um, I think that was like healthy. a stool sample I had to give for the yeast. I think that's yeah, what it yeah. was, but someone else did it with you recently. And I think we were describing, this is how gross this all is. We were describing the stool samples we had to pick. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's a lot, it's a lot less or the, the process is a little different now. Anyway, we'll just leave that for now. But uh, yeah, so the, so the gut health, it, I don't know if we talked about this in this uh, podcast, but gut health and immune health are directly linked. Yeah, got right? it. Okay. The better your gut is, the better your immune system. 80% of your immune system is based in your gut. Sorry, right, if so you're the, thinking so, about where to impact, it's like you're keeping your gut healthy, will keep your immune healthy long term. Okay. And so you were talking about leaky liver, but then the keeping the gut healthy prevents that leaky gut where the membranes of your, uh, kind of the gut lining, kind of the intestinal yep. walls are just more tight. So toxins yep. aren't leaking through them. Am I describing that kind of accurately? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. So if you think of your intestines as a tube outside of that tube is where all your immune system sits because it's there in case anything breaks through. Like if you went and drank like swamp water right now, your body has to have a mechanism in place to be like, what's coming into our system. We need to screen this, right? Yeah, got it. It's like going through customs or whatever. It's like these guys are, just, your immune system is just sitting there waiting. Like, what are you trying to bring into this body right now? So if your gut lining is compromised through stress, food sensitivities, that's why we check for food sensitivities. Cause if you don't react well to gluten, for example, and it's a sensitivity for you and you're eating a lot of it, it just breaks open that wall. Now the, the door is open and your immune system is there and it has to deal with everything that's coming in. It has to work triple overtime. And that's the basis for a lot of auto, for all autoimmune conditions is that your immune system is overstimulated. And then if it's overstimulated chronically, it'll start to attack different parts of your body. So if it attacks the joints, it's rheumatoid arthritis. If it attacks your thyroid, it's um, hypothyroid, Hashimoto's hypothyroid. So like all of those things are linked. And if you notice right now, like, People with autoimmune, autoimmune conditions are super scared, which is COVID-19 going around, right? Because now your immune system is basically not ready. It's just overworked. It's not ready to take on anything. So you're at a much higher risk. Anything autoimmune, you got to be really isolating and doing everything you can. But to prevent getting an autoimmune, if you take one step back, you need to make sure your gut is healthy and working well. And that's why we assess that. Like we can, we can check how well you're gut is functioning and and adjust that but i think like the overarching message is keeping gut healthy and keeping yourself healthy as, as much as you can from this point onwards like this this is probably like there's never been a time that is becoming more important to keep that especially like moving forward and where does sleep sleep like so if gut's 80 percent of the immune system um, where does sleep come in? Because I know sleep's important, but that's not going to affect the bacteria in your gut, will it? Yeah, so sleep, basically, when you when you sleep for, you have to sleep a minimum of seven hours based on the data now. But in that seven hours, your immune system actually turns on and kind of cleans out your whole body, like flushes out your lymphatic fluid and does like a wash over your whole system while you're sleeping. So it kind of recharges your immune system every day. Um, that's kind of the mechanism for that. And then if you're, if you're not sleeping, you're not able to tap into that kind of built in mechanism. It's almost like if you shut your computer off every night before you go to bed, let's say, and everything kind of resets and reshuffles, you turn it on again in the morning, it's all like fresh and ready to go again. Um, I don't know if that's how the new computers work, but I remember like back in the day, you shut your computer off before bed. So it kind of resets everything, but that's a similar idea. And like the, your lymphatic fluid washes over your brain, washes over everything. Um, so it'll re recharge your immune, but also resets your um, uh, nervous system, cleans up any damage in your body. Um, that's why for our athletes too, we see if they don't sleep well, they get sick more often and their recovery is terrible if they're is, sore. 
And is that happening in any specific stage? Like, is that happening during the deep sleep stage or REM or just any kind of sleep matters? Because I know from wearing like a whoop band or an aura ring or whatever, I, I know very little about sleep overall, but I just understand those different stages because I see it listed on my app of all these different things. So for for that type of flushing to occur, like the reboot, like you used, which is a good example still. I don't know, I'm a Mac person, so I don't reboot it often, but when I was a Windows yeah. person, I had to reboot yeah. regularly, right? But um, uh, is, uh, uh, yeah, that, that noise has been ongoing in the background. So yeah, is there a certain type of sleep you need? Yeah. So all the evidence shows you, you want to aim for 20% of deep sleep. The deep sleep seems to be the most important marker. So if you have a whoop band or a Fitbit or an Apple watch or any of those things, you usually have it broken down. So you'll see the percentage of sleep. So you'll see um, like deep light uh, REM and total sleep. So you want to try to get 20% in deep sleep is the key thing. Everyone talks about REM sleep, but there's not a lot of data on REM sleep and exactly how what you should have uh, in terms of the benefits for it. But deep sleep, there's very um, solid evidence on 20% you want to aim for per night. So like the ratio is important. So let's say you only slept six hours last night, but you still got 20% of deep sleep, then you're still getting a lot of the benefits of that. And then if you try to get seven hours sleep and 20% deep, then you're really like optimizing stuff and you're going to keep everything strong, immune function, metabolism. There's so many things that happen when you sleep that, the, the more um, stuff that's coming out every day on sleep seems to be the, the biggest kind of emerging field right now. The last 20 years have been all gut. Now it's like sleep. And then I think liver stuff is going to be the, the next like big wave. Cool. Thanks. So just on that, the, the sleep stuff, Nick for my birthday got me one of those Uller pads that like kind of cools your, your bed because on my, from my whoop data for years, it was really confusing. And you helped me with this because my deep sleep was so low. We figured out that if I stopped eating at eight o'clock at night, it really helped me have a chance to have some deep sleep because I was getting like two, three hours of like REM sleep. Like I would get incredible amounts of REM sleep, but then I would literally have eight to 10 minutes of deep sleep. I've showed Nick data before where I'll have like three minutes of deep sleep now. But, but if I have no alcohol and I stop eating at eight o'clock, I can get deep sleep and I still won't get as much as Nick gets. Nick gets more than me. But now with this pad that kind of cools my body, I seem to consistently be able to get at least an hour of deep sleep. And recently I hit an hour and 45 minutes of deep sleep, which I've never like never had. So, and I have to combine that to get that. I have to have no alcohol. Um, I have to stop eating by eight o'clock and use this chili pad thing that kind of cools me yeah. down a little bit. Those three together seem like the magical combo for me. Does that, does that make yeah. sense to you? Yeah. The chili pad, I was going to say that there's a thing out there called the chili pad. So yeah. So that's awesome. Yeah. So the thing that matters for sleep is your core body temperature. So that's why that makes a big difference. And if, and the reason why you're, if you stop eating earlier in the night, like you've been doing, your body has more chance to cool down. So it's your internal temperature that determines like how deep your sleep is, if that makes sense. So if you're eating, a lot of blood goes to your stomach and your internal temperature is hotter, so you're not gonna get as deep of sleep. So cutting your eating window, like how you've been doing, I think around like seven or 8 p.m. I think is the last time you're eating. So you've got a few hours for your body to cool. And then when you're on the chili pad, you're cooling it even more. Um, so some of the most effective strategies for deep sleep are cooling your room um, you could even take like a warm shower or warm bath in the evening so that when you get out of the bath, that w the cold air hits your whole system and cools your core temperature really quickly. Got it. Okay. That makes sense. Um, I never thought of it that way. It makes sense. Yeah. So if the cooler your, your core temperature is, the deeper you can sleep um, overall. And a lot of people, a lot of people do the reverse, right? Like to take like a cold or like um, a co an ice bath to recover in the evening or something like that. So the reverse will happen. So when you get out, your body will warm really quickly and now your internal temperature is warmer and then your sleep's going to be disrupted, right? So the chili pad is a cool thing. We have a lot of people that use those, especially people who travel, they'll bring it with them and because hotel sleeping is notoriously bad. So if you have the chili pad on your hotel um, bed, it'll cool your temperature and allow you to sleep a bit deeper. Um, alcohol will disrupt REM sleep. Marijuana will disrupt REM sleep as well. Um, so those things will have an effect. And a lot of the sleep medications will um, just skip you through the sleep cycles in general. 
a lot of the hardcore pharmaceuticals. Um, but I think if you're um, ending your eating early enough and you're cooling your temperature, um, you can get closer to that 20% um, deep sleep. Yeah, got it. Okay. That's been super valuable. You're right. You're making me think that I need to, I, I'm going to try and stop eating even earlier. At one point you had me at like 7.30, I think it was. I think I'm going to go back to 7.30 or even 7, see if I can do that. Okay. I'm the worst. I go downstairs for like an extra meal at like 9.30 or 10. <laughs> yeah. I load up some peanut butter and I'm like yeah. all sorts of fat and calories. And then I still end up going to sleep. But your deep sleep seems to, like Nick's deep sleep, he seems to be able to do that. And then his deep, deep sleep data is fine. And then mine, yeah. will literally, I will literally go to like, I've seen three minutes multiple times, right? Yep. Definitely, I'm a weird case because my HRV readings are really weird. I think I've shared that with you before yeah. too. So, yeah. But those are all connected, right? Your HRV is measuring your nervous system. Yeah, got so it. So the, the, the lower your HRV score is, the less you're getting into the deeper, deeper sleep categories. And everyone's different too, right? That's why in this day and age, it's so cool that we have these measuring devices, right? So you can... Like we often have our patients show us their data. Like I always ask you for your, your whoop data or whatever. Now it's my aura ring. Have. Yeah. Yeah. Aura ring. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we always, we always look at that because then we can make individual interventions, right? Like maybe for Nick, he's fine eating later at night. And then all of a sudden, let's say we see your deep sleep percentage drop off the map. Then maybe we should make some changes to your routine or, or what you're doing, but your, your body's actually designed with light sensors. I know I've talked to you guys about this in some of the presentations before, but that's the reason why that you've got that circadian rhythm happening. So your all your digestive organs have light sensors. So they know when it's light or dark out, which is a crazy concept because they're inside your body. But your liver has light receptors, your intestines, your stomach, they all have light receptors. So if you're putting food in when it's dark outside, you're kind of like jamming up the machine a little bit. So that's why like you're probably going to do better. Most people in general will do better if they're eating less food when it's darker out and eating more food when it's lighter out. Got it. In general, you'll see it. And then it makes sense with the cooling of the body too. Cause like, think about it in the past, like our ancestors, um, it wouldn't have been light out. So you're not going to go down in the basement like Nick and have like a peanut butter jelly sandwich. <laughs> you wouldn't have the capability. Right. So like 200 years ago or something, you would only be able to eat when the light was out. Got it. You're making me think of my grandparents' farm over in Croatia. And Nick, I'm sure you remember, sometimes we'd go there in, in the middle of winter. Oh, gosh. It was yeah. so cold at night. Like yeah. there was no, yeah. there's no heating in the bedroom. There's no heating in yeah. the bedrooms. So th these are kind of like cement stone walls and that's it. Yeah. There's no insulation. It's just that wall. And then there were so many covers on the bed. Like I felt like I was going to suffocate sometimes, but but you know, they have those relaxing blankets now, the weighted blankets. That's yeah, basically, yeah. that's, that was existed way back oh then. That's gosh. how we slept. Yeah. yeah, I remember that. It did feel good, actually. I didn't know that was a current thing, but it did kind of feel good. But it's still, you were still cool. Like you still yeah. were cool, right? So and you probably slept really well. Oh my gosh, you slept like a champion there for sure. And uh, yeah, it's funny, like everything you're saying is just reminding me how right everyone had things 200 years ago and how we've kind of just ruined everything. For sure. For so. sure. And then you think about the light impact, right? Like we have artificial lighting, you have screens, like your eyes aren't really designed to read those kind of lights, right? So they tell your brain that you should be on. On. Like yeah. the light on, this is why they always talk about screens at night, because the screens at light at night, your eyes read that and it raises your nighttime cortisol level. So if cortisol is activated, melatonin can't be activated. So then your brain, you're tricking your brain to be awake. You're telling your brain that it's the sun just came up, starting to start your day. Meanwhile, you're trying to fall asleep. Yeah, got it. Got See it. what I mean? Crazy. So there's a lot of, I mean, technology has been amazing. I mean, there's so many ways, but there's also some, some drawbacks. Right? Of course. Yeah, totally. Like Okay, so thank you for this. I want to honor your time, uh, Dr. Cowan. Sure. If anyone is in the vicinity on, of the G Greater Toronto area, Golden Horseshoe area, how would they? I know, and actually, you do online. So yeah, just tell me how how do people get to, to to know you more? Website, contact information. What are you up to? Yeah, so our website is uh, phenomhpm.com. So p h e n o m h p m dot com. Um, yeah, we're doing everything virtually, all telemedicine right now, which we've already been doing for a number of years. We've been lucky that. My team has been set up like that for, for a number of years. So we have a team of four um, naturopathic doctors and we're also functional medicine doctors. So we all practice the same way. Um, we also have a mental performance coach on our team as well. So she helps people deal with like 
uh, this, she's really busy right now, actually, because of stress and lack of sleep. She's teaching people how to breathe and manage stress and manage mindset. Um, she works with a lot of Olympians and really um, top class performers, executives and things like that. So, um, yeah, so you can book with any of us through our website. And then we have social media. We have a clinic page, which is Phenom HPM. It's our Instagram. And then I have my own one, which is Phenom underscore doc. Uh, and then we have our Facebook page too, which is just Phenom High Performance Medicine. So we try to put like different types of content on each channel to keep people updated and um, aware. And we get a lot of emails and a lot of questions. So we're trying to tailor our information based on what everyone's asking us these days. And a lot of it we touched on today, like immune system and how to optimize. And um, during this time, we really want people to, you know, be inspired and motivated. You know, it's like positivity. And you guys are always like that, but keeping people moving forward and thinking about what's ahead. And I think based on the data, we're probably going to be in the state for a number of months. So a lot of people who are thinking, you know, I'll just sit at home, drink beer every day for the next week or so, and then we'll be back to work. It's probably going to be like this for a couple of months. All right. So it's a good time to use this, this time to your advantage. Um, even like we have four athletes that are, we're supposed to go to the Olympics coming up. Right. And uh, I expected them, they've been working their whole life. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You know, and they have other commitments. Some of them have signed full scholarship deals and starting in September after the Olympics are over. And now it's been postponed a year. So now they have to make huge life decisions, oh, right? Geez. So crazy. it's crazy. It's crazy time. But what has been inspiring just talking to them in the last two weeks, each, all four of them are using this time to their advantage. Like I expected them to be like down in the dump, right? Like that's it. I'm not training. I'm going to eat like garbage. <laughs> what they're doing now is to try to get ahead which is like the coolest thing, right? It's like, cause they're training on their own, but they're like, how can I get better than my competitors while they're all flipping right now? They're all taking time off. How do we get ahead? So when everything's back, they're moving forward. So I think this is a good time for people to stay positive and look for um, what can you do to get yourself improved over the next couple of months. Awesome. Thanks. For this. I'm just going to repeat the URL because I think you, I cut out or you cut out uh, listening to you say it. So it's phenom, P-H-E-N-O-M-H-P-M, which stands for high yeah. performance medicine. So phenom, H-P-M.com. Yeah. We'll link to it on our websites and stuff as well. Thanks for doing everything with, no you know, for, with Rockstar, with us, ourselves, our families, yeah. uh, with Rockstar, you've been, you know, your team has been teaching classes here in the Rockstar offices to Rockstar and our circle members. We, uh, inner circle members totally appreciate that so just you know thank you for everything you're doing we really really appreciate it and thanks for sharing thank all this you. information very timely so thank you of course man. thank you guys my pleasure